Okay. So, hello. Hello. To start off with, would you like to say your name and where you are? Uh, my name is Stuart Simon, and I live in uh, Newton, Massachusetts, which is uh, really the suburbs of, of Boston. So for people that don't know Massachusetts, it's probably easier to say I live in the Boston area. Okay. All right. And the first big question is, who are you? Who are you as a human being? And that can be passions, values, qualities, whatever you'd like. Oh, golly, how long? How long an answer are we looking for? <laughs> <Go ahead. laughs> who am I as a human being? Uh, what can I say about that? Um, well, you know, it's, it, if I start sort of at the top and maybe work down, I mean, I'm, I'm, I'm a, I'm a white male, uh, so that in some ways defines me. Um, I'm also Jewish, which in a funny way defines me and doesn't, uh, because I was I was raised uh, secular as a secular Jew. But even more than that, a lot of often secular Jews were raised uh, in. Jewish communities so that they they had sort of an ethnic support around them. Uh, my father was a career military officer. In fact, he was a West Point graduate, which may or may not mean anything to mm -hmm. people from up in the U.S., but it's sort of an odd thing to be a, a Jewish West Point graduate. Therefore, it's sort of an odd thing to be the son of a Jewish West Point graduate who happened to marry a Jewish woman. So I am, in fact, Jewish, but not as secular, but oddly not even defined by my secularness. So I'm that. Um, and I stumble over the question significantly because I, I, I'm a white male. So whatever that means about having a certain kind of global acceptance, right? And white men sort of show up and, and, and you, it's 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 in the world that somehow you're going to be received but i have an odd experience of of um <clears throat> not knowing where i fit in a more personal psychological way i mm -hmm. i i grew up as an army brat i uh i played college football which may or may not you know which means something and play college football and i'm a gestalt therapist and love being a gestalt therapist and for whatever reason those those things don't go together for me also so there's all these funny little places where i feel like i don't fit so if i went back and and met with my college football teammates they, they would have no re, they would have no relationship to anything i do hmm. I, I, none that would be, be, be almost meaningless to them and when i hang out with my my gestalt therapy friends and my colleagues and my friends i almost never can talk about football hmm. but both of those things are enormously meaningful to me so i have this odd experience of not quite knowing where i fit so when you say who are you it's it's not a it's a question that i find really almost impossible to answer hmm. so that's the best one i have okay well what about values do you, would you say that you hold any particular values well i think the yeah, again it's an interesting question i think probably the values i have are, are, are very similar to most of my colleagues i you know fairness and equality I, i've had my awareness raised as much as anybody else about systemic racism and 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 all of the things that we that i knew about but didn't really know about and know about more now in the last six months in the last year if you asked me if i knew it of course i'd know it but know it in a more visceral way but i think that's pretty similar to most of my friends and colleagues um, i think of myself as a progressive um, person in the world but i think that's pretty similar so i don't i don't know how to define myself with my values either because it feels like that makes me actually, I started out by telling you I don't know where I fit. And now I'm telling you, I feel like I fit with almost everybody. So in a funny way, that doesn't define me either. But 
uh, um, you know, values and fairness and decency. I'm, I find a lot of value in, in, in discovering what I, what I didn't know about misogyny, about systemic racism, about, about anti-Semitism, about, uh, so I'm, I find myself more and more interested in that, right? Mm -hmm. That you can know about this and not really know about it. You know, if you're a white male, you're sort of sheltered in a, mm -hmm. in a very real way. When, when my wife told me probably 10 years ago that every single woman she knows at some point was costed in some way or another by a man. I, 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 I didn't think it wasn't true. I was sort of in the moment I went, oh, of course, but I don't have to think about that. Mm -hmm. So I don't know, my values, I guess one of my values is, is, is that it continues to be important to me to understand what I don't know in the world. Mm -hmm. that, that is interesting in itself. So, yeah. okay. I, I can take you off the hook from that one if you want. And I'm curious a little bit about your history. So I'm wondering what comes to mind, and these are all sort of very gestalty, you know, the sure. figure will pop up kind of questions. Okay. Um, about what comes to mind as an event or as a set of circumstances in your life that you would say significantly impacted you? Um, I cry easily, so I'm, I'm, hmm. I, just so nobody worries. <laughs> um, When I was about four or five, uh, we were living in Japan. My father was stationed with the Navy. He was actually an army um, colonel, but we were stationed with the Navy. We lived in Japan. And um, I don't know why that's important to the story, but anyway, there we lived in Japan. I was about four or five. And somehow or another, I lit a fire. I think, you know, memory is funny, but I, I, I'm pretty sure that this actually happened. I lit a fire and it and it was confluent with some sex play with this neighborhood girl. And the fire got out of control and fire engine had to come. It was in the weeds behind our house and the fire got out of control. The firemen, fire people came, the firefighters came, the MPs came, military police came. My parents weren't home. And, you know, they were 21, 22. They, what did they know? And they threatened me. They told me if I ever did it again, they were going to throw me in jail. Which, you know, do what you want. You can imagine what it's like to be four or five and be told that. Mm -hmm. So I, what, what I was really left with was this idea that some, somehow this, this sex play and the fire got connected. Ooh. And the next three or four years in my memory, um, I, I had horrible, horrible experiences going to sleep at night, racked with, I, I, you know, it was, it was so profound. I don't know whether we'd call it shame or guilt, but it was a horrible, horrible experience. It lasted for two or three years. Then I started to have memories uh, or beliefs. There were men outside my window. They were going to come and take me away. As I got to be about six or seven, the best I can figure is that my I developed enough cognition that maybe there was something about this story that wasn't right. Mm -hmm. And but I would be terrified at night. But I I I occurred to me that if I told my mother, maybe there was an out here. And I went and told her, and she did a you know, we could do hours on my disappointments with my mother mm. and I probably could do hours with the way she doing the best she could was a terrific mother but in this moment she was terrific and she said the things that you would hope an adult would say to a kid and it all went away 
the reason I, I tell you that story is I realize how many clients I see who aren't really sure there's help in the world. You know, they, they come into therapy and I, these are just the clients. I mean, how many people walk through the world without really knowing that you could rely on somebody? And I, it, I think, I think it made a big difference in my life that I came away from that moment. I can tell you where I was, where I was standing, but probably could tell you the day of the week if I knew what days of the week were at set A7. But it occurred to me that I came away from it with the belief that there really was help in the world. And, and I think that's, that's, that's had a profound impact on how I move through the world, that you can rely mm. on people. That not everybody, not everybody gets it right. Not everybody does, says the perfect thing, but, but that people can rely on people. And I, I think it had a, I think it really made a difference about how I came out. It's, it's a very different way of walking through the world, yes. knowing that and never having known it. Yeah. Yeah. So wow. there you go. So it, it's in a funny way, there's my life between four and seven, which was just racked with just, I don't even know what you call it. How horrible, I, how horrible, how horrible mm -hmm. I was. And then relief, mm -hmm. just for one moment. So wow. there you go. Hmm. And I am also curious in, sounds like you've moved around a fair bit and had a fairly varied life. So I'm wondering who you have run into, who you would say another person um, who you've met along the way is that's had an influence on you or an impact. Well, the easiest person to say, and it's also the truest person, is Sonia Nevis. Do you know, do you know the name Sonia Nevis? Mm -hmm. The name? Yeah. Yes. I've yes. Never, I never met her. Um, Sonia was my therapist, my, my mentor, and my colleague. Um, and um, Uh, she probably had more impact on me than anybody besides my family, whatever, I, you know, the, how, how could my family not have had a huge impact on who I was, but in terms of a person that, that, that stands out, um, Sonia, uh, you know, we, I could, I could do two hours just on Sonia, things Sonia mm -hmm. said, things Sonia did, things in ways that she was important to me. Um, Got to tell you one story about her. Okay. Uh, I was, I was, I, I started out as a client of hers. Um, <clears throat> Sonia being Sonia, uh, in, under some circumstances, the boundaries were malleable and I went from being a client to being a, a colleague of hers. And so we taught together at uh, the Gestalt uh, International Study Center. And, and one day I was uh, teaching with her and we'd had a particularly good day of teaching and I was just all filled up with how much I enjoyed teaching, how much I enjoyed teaching with her. And it was just this you know, lovely feeling and the day was wonderful. And so I walked up to her and I said, uh, Sonia, I just can't imagine what my life would have been like if I hadn't met you. And Sonia being Sonia, she kind of put her hand on my shoulder and as she walked past me and kind of moved on she said "Ah, eh, maybe it would have been rich <laughs> she, she wasn't all that interested in my adulation now in fact of course she was she was interested in the relationship and, then, and Sonia liked adulation as much as anybody else but somehow that moment also captures something about Sonia and my relationship with her hmm. And how did she influence your life? Well, I'm only hesitating because I could I could probably talk to you about three hours just about Sonia. So I have to sort of see where I land in this moment, recognizing mm -hmm. all the other things I'm not going to be able to tell you. Um, Sonia was a 
as you know, is a Gestalt therapist and a Gestalt theorist, and um, you know, one of the leading voices of Gestalt uh, around the world. Um, But the biggest influence I think she had, and I don't know how to separate how much of that was how she, her practice and who she was, was I came away from most of my being a client with her with the feeling that it was all in the relationship. That, you know, I, I can make up a story and it might, it might be a, a good one and you probably could too about how our theory informs us. I think what I learned from Sonia is, is the theory, if you use it well, informs you about how to be connected to your client, how to figure out how to, how to be in relationship with your client in a way that that particular client needs at that particular time. And some of that is theory, but some of that is just who you are, who I am, who she was. And it was magnificent uh, being her client because she was so available to be uh, impactful and to be impacted. And I just learned so much about um, just how magnificent a relationship can be in healing from her. She could be so present, so completely present and available uh, in a way that it just was Sonia. <laughs> I miss her a lot. She died about mm -hmm. five, six years ago. Mm -hmm. I've, that seems like a great loss to yeah. a lot of people. Yeah, she, it was a, it was a, Sonia was somebody who could be a great loss to a lot of people and none of us would be jealous of how she was a loss to somebody else. How about mm -hmm. that? Because hmm. we all felt our special relationship with her. I suspect even for people that only met her for an hour or so, they probably felt that. Mm. So nobody was crawling over at the top of each other to get to her. You know, mm. we, we all felt our own particular relationship with her that was just magnificent. Well, coming back into you a little bit, you mentioned that you're sort of grappling with some of the issues around um, your own identity, your privilege, your power, those kinds of things. I'm also wondering about your age mm -hmm. and how you are experiencing yourself as a man of a certain age right now. So would you say more about that question? I, I mean, I, I, I would answer, but, but is, is mm -hmm. a particular thing you're wondering about? Um, no, I'm wondering, I mean, I, I don't know if you want to get into more. I'm, I am curious how you are experiencing and understanding your power and your privilege and yourself as a man or in your masculinity. Um, but if that sort of seems like something that you're still chewing on, or if you want to say something to it, that's fine. I'm also wondering about your age. So different aspects of yourself, but sure. however you're well, understanding. Yeah, I was trying to, I was, I was trying to see, trying to understand how age fit into the question. I, I don't need to, I can just answer the question and, and be glad to, but it was there something about age that, okay. I think about that. Um, When I was uh, 24, 25, I, uh, I, I moved to Boston to, to, because I had a friend who lived here. Um, <clears throat> I was hitchhiking around the country and, and Boston just seemed like nirvana for somebody who had spent most, I spent most of my years, even though we moved around a lot, I spent most of my years in, in Virginia and the suburbs of Virginia. So whatever your image is of suburbs of Washington, DC, they're probably not too far off the mark. It's, you know, it's, it's, they're pretty limited and the culture is limited. I mean, DC had a lot going on, but I lived in the suburbs. So, you know, tract housing and public schools with mostly, mostly white kids and all that. So when I, and I went to a Southern white boys college. Um, so when I, when I, 
when I moved to Boston, it was like Nirvana. And I lived with this uh, I, for a little while before I found a place to live. I, I moved in with a, a friend of mine, a woman, and she lived in a house filled with women. They were, I think all of them were, 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 were lesbians. And I just thought this was the coolest thing. Well, why was that such a cool thing? <laughs> that, that was my early, early being delighted with myself for being so open and progressive. And uh, she's, she's still Judy. She's still one of my best friends now, 40 years later. But I, it, I had sort of a naive as I, I could only have the awareness I had I said that I was, I was a pretty progressive guy that I could live and be friends with lots of lesbian women. And that was kind of a good thing to be <clears throat> um, with very little understanding as has happened over the last 10 or 15 years for me, maybe more of how little I really know about yeah. power and, I mean, just the idea that uh, um, if I'm, um, if I have, if, if, if I raise my voice, I don't intend to raise my voice. I don't say, now I'm going to raise my voice because I want to assert my masculinity. I do it when I feel powerless, when I'm feeling misunderstood, when I'm feeling um, injured, if I'm with my wife, I don't do it as a as as a calculation but who cares when i raise my voice it scares her right so uh understanding that and understanding more and more and more and more about how just my size i'm six foot and 215 pounds my size means something my mm -hmm. voice means something my color means something um and how and and the best i can say is i'm i'm more and more available to discover what i don't know and try to know more things um about um masculinity and femininity and and men and women and and privilege and um the and so the best I have is is I'm I'm more and more as much as I think I know I'm more and more aware of what I don't know, the mm -hmm. the riots, the protests, even calling them riots, they, they co-opted protests and turned it into riots, the Black Lives Matter protests. Um, uh, I found them stunningly moving. Uh, uh, that people would put themselves at risk, at, you know, so much COVID at that time, and they were still out in the streets. And um, so I'm moved by how much I don't know. That's the best I can say and how, how interested I am in it and in the courage that it takes to, to say, um, you, you know, you guys, you don't have it right. We're here and you don't really see us and how much courage that takes so that's the best answer i have right now yeah and it's it's a very complete answer i don't want to say anything on top of that so thank you so i will take you a little bit further off the hook and i will ask about your gestalt life okay. and how that started how did you and gestalt meet well my first connection with Gestalt was was not really a Gestalt connection. I started out when I was when I moved up from Virginia to live in Boston. Um, I have what retrospectively I think was some. It may not have been an anxiety disorder, but I had a lot of anxiety, and I I didn't really understand that. I thought I was just horribly insecure. I didn't have language that helped me understand anxiety. So I got into therapy fairly young when I was like 22, 23 <clears throat> with a guy that practiced. I don't, do, you, do you remember bioenergetics? Does that yeah. mean anything to you? Okay. Yeah. Well, he was a bioenergetics therapist 
and uh, but he was also he he used a lot of gestalt techniques, and um, again retrospectively, I realized the the thing that really mattered to me was the relationship. I, I didn't have any language for it. I mean, I would do all the bioenergetic moves and the poses and the stress positions. And we would have these weekends where we would go, or weeks, we would go away and have these marathon therapy sessions of, of bioenergetics work. But retrospectively, it was all, all I really cared about was the relationship to this guy. I just wanted him to like me. Oh. I just, you know, I wanted to be connected to him. I, I wanted to be understood by him. Mm -hmm. uh, and um, which was fine because there was plenty of that to be had but I I thought it was all the therapy but it wasn't it was all the relationship somewhere along the line when I finished graduate school I went to social work school and and a friend of mine went to the Gestalt Institute of Cleveland and I, I went out there and I met Sonia Nevis uh, whom I actually didn't like at first I, I didn't like her I thought she was kind of kooky um, and I thought she was too, um, well, it's a funny thing to say. I, I thought she was too kind and too gentle. Now, remember, I'd been in this bioenergetics mm -hmm. therapy with this guy and we'd done all bioenergetics and I didn't understand even then how much it was really the relationship. Anyway, um, so I came back to Boston and the two or three of my friends and colleagues who, who had gone to the Gestalt Institute of Cleveland and really connected with Sonia started a supervision group and uh, said, well, you know, with Sonia, said, why don't you come and join us? And I, I said, with who? And she said, they said, well, Sonia. I said, no, nah, I don't like Sonia. So I said, no. Thankfully, they asked me again six months later and they said, you really ought to, you really ought to come and get a little experience of this with Sonia. I said, oh, okay. And um, that's when I begin to understand that whatever therapy was, it was in the relationship. And Sonia was a Gestalt practitioner. And so I decided, I think accurately so, that what she was doing was Sonia, but it was also Sonia being informed by Gestalt. Mm -hmm. And and if she could work in the relationship that way, I could never, I didn't say, and then I'll go be Sonia. Although I think there's lots of us who aspire to be Sonia. <laughs> I think there's lots of us that try to be Sonia. I didn't say I'll go be Sonia, but I did say, whatever Sonia is, it's informed by Gestalt and I'm going to learn more about that. So I spent the next 20 or 30 years learning Gestalt therapy from being in supervision groups with Sonia. So every once in a while, she would, she would say this funny thing. She would say, um, you know, if you go out in the world, tell people you're a Gestalt therapist. And I would go, okay. And I thought, why is she telling me that? And I, Mostly, I wouldn't. You know, the 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 eighties and nineties were not kind to Gestalt. <laughs> you know, especially in a a, a, a highly prof um, uh, academic community like Boston, where there's a tremendous amount of psychoanalytic theory. So I mostly wouldn't. Uh, but as I've gotten older. I mean, I, but inside I was always a Gestalt practitioner mm -hmm. and more and more I started being a Gestalt practitioner outside and saying it right out loud. So I, I laugh because my wife and I have been invited. I've been invited a couple of times to teach at the Harvard Couples Conference. Now, if we say this the way it should be said, it would be like the, the Harvard Couples Conference. And it's a very, very prestigious place to go. And, I'm impressed. <laughs> well, thank you. <laughs> thank you. I love saying I'm a Gestalt practitioner when I go there. Mm. I've, I've taught there twice. The second time, uh, the second time my, my wife and I taught together. It's a short, I call her my wife. It's just easier. My, my life partner, Sharona Halpern. She and I were invited to teach there, and we, we went for the afternoon. We were supposed to teach, and it was just one, one uh, 
person after another reading their slides. And so we, 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 we knew we weren't going to do that, but we didn't know what we, we weren't, we didn't know we were going to do what we did, which was when it was our turn, we went and took everything off the dais. We took the podium off the dais. We took everything off and we turned it into an experiential exercise. We sort of joke. We said, we, you know, we broke the Harvard couples conference. Well, we didn't break the Harvard couples conference. We didn't break it at all, but we did bring Gestalt, a Gestalt approach to it. So I went from, that's a long way of going from, I went from, I'm not going to tell anybody I'm a Gestalt therapist to saying at the Harvard Couples Conference, we are Gestalt practitioners mm -hmm. and, and delightfully so. Hmm. so that's, okay. that's my history with Gestalt. Mm -hmm. and, and what is it that you found in those 20, 30 years of Gestalt that you now name it and embrace it? What did you find there? Well, it, 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 it was the thing I was teasing earlier that when I was in bioenergetics therapy and we were, I, you may or may not know there's all these positions and these stress positions and these growling and all sorts of yeah. hitting and all that kind of stuff you do. That though I didn't have language for it retrospectively, I, it was, I was, what I really wanted was the relationship with the clinician. That's what I wanted. Mm -hmm. I wanted to feel connected to him. I wanted him to like me. I wanted him to understand me. I wanted to be uh, in contact with him. And what Gestalt has given me is the sanction, the freedom to, to amplify that kind of work, to, 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 to work by being in relationship with people. And I, um, I just, I just love that. I just love that. It's, you know, I, I, I marvel at artists, visual artists, performing artists, actors. I just, I just love the mo that kind of moment of creativity that you see on a stage or a live concert, something like that. Gestalt, and and I'm, I'm not, I, you know, I can't draw. I mean, I know people always say, yeah, yeah, you really can. I pro maybe I can, but I haven't figured it out yet, and I'm mm -hmm. probably not. I'm seventy, so I'm probably not. But but Gestalt theory and Gestalt practice g gives me moments of feeling like, oh, that was a creative, that mm -hmm. that thing that happened between us. That was creativity. Um, there you go. Yeah. And so what do you do with it? I mean, how do you work or what have some of your significant projects been? Well, I, I don't know that the, the, the creativity is in the projects as much as it's in the, the work, the therapy work. Mm -hmm. um, I certainly, I do a lot of teaching. I, I started out just doing kind of standard um, uh, corporate training, you know, negotiating skills before I thought before most of my teaching now is in the Gestalt world. Mm -hmm. But when I was much younger, I, I, um, I have a real performance Jones, or at least a te not a performance Jones, a teaching Jones, I, I just, mm -hmm. uh, which was a problem because I hated public speaking. Oh. I, I, I was terrified. The only thing worse than public speaking would be to not do public speaking. So um, I, I didn't, do you remember Dale Carnegie courses? Does that mean anything to you? Yeah. 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 Well, I, I, I couldn't not teach, but I, but I, but I, but I was terrified. So I took myself to a Dale Carnegie course and, and got my courage up. And then I started um, doing corporate training and, um, I just loved every minute of it. I, I, I you know, I, I, my, my wife teases me. She says, you, you know, you could teach the same program 50 times and, and it would be fun for you. And I say, well, yeah, but you know, actors go up on stage and they, they do the same play 50 times. It's because the audience is different. So it's a different moment. It's not the mm -hmm. same moment. It's not they're doing the same thing over and over again. So, um, so a lot of so it, I think of those as moments of creativity. But but um, when Sonia invited me to be part of the faculty at, at uh, GISC, I found that much more satisfying 
than what I was mm -hmm. doing uh, when I was doing kind of traditional stand-up corporate training. And and I I find those to be very creative moments, doing just mm -hmm. standing in front of a class and figuring out how to connect with them and how to be available to them. Mm -hmm. uh, I think of that as creativity. So. I don't know how we got here. Um, I don't remember the no, question. No, no, it was, it was what you do with this. So that's that's definitely the answer. Okay. And I am, I'm wondering, I mean, aside from actually getting into the speaking position, what are some of the challenges that you've run up against in in this world? In 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 the world, in, in me interacting in the world. Well, either yourself What's, in the world or within the Gestalt world, or just things that come to mind as challenges. Well, the biggest challenges I have are really internal. Mm -hmm. They're my own internal challenges. You want me to talk about those? If you want to, you don't sure, have to. Sure. Yeah. You don't have to go all the way into them. I mean, you can just name them if you want. Yeah. Well, I have, I have, um, um, the, the, the biggest problem, the hardest time I have is it's really easy for me to feel, uh, to feel bad. Oh. Yeah. That's, that feels like the biggest challenge I have. I mean, the, you know, I, I have lots of opportunity to do work that I like. Uh, I feel really lucky, you know, some friends of mine sometimes say I'm just lucky and I feel lucky, I, you know, whatever that is, I feel fortunate, mm -hmm. you know, I'm big and I have, you know, dimples and, you know, a red, you know, an inviting face and I think, you know, that makes a difference. Mm -hmm. And um, so I, I feel fortunate that way. But the biggest challenges I have is how easy it is for me to think I did something wrong and to feel to fall into pits of shame. And, and I, I remember once I, I was doing a, um, a, a, a in part of our, one of our training programs, I was doing a supervision group and I made a really bad mistake. And um, <clears throat> I realized I'd made the mistake. The, the, I really insulted somebody badly and the woman was smart enough to get up and get out of the room, get away from me. And um, when she came back, I apologized and I told her what had happened and I, I figured out what had gotten triggered in me. And you know, it, it doesn't make it all better, but I made it as better as I could. And uh, I came home that night and was talking to faculty and I just felt terrible. I mean, just terrible. It was it, it, terrible. And I think you, you might have interviewed Joe Melnick. Joe was very mm -hmm. funny. He looked at me and he, didn't have disgust in his voice, but he, he just said, and it was, it was kind of just matter of fact, he just said, you just feel too bad. And he kind of walked away. And surprisingly, that was helpful. Oh. It was helpful because it gave me a little perspective mm -hmm. for all the work I've done on it and how easy I kind of fall into these holes. But yeah, you know, I'll, I'll use that as a touchstone. Maybe I'm Maybe, you know, because I, you know, I, I'm going to go to my grave feeling bad. I'm 70 years old. I've been working on it forever. It's, you know, if I live to be another, if I'm lucky and I have 25 more years, I don't think it's going to get a lot better. It'll get a little better, but I can use it as kind of a touch. I'm, maybe I don't have to feel so bad about that. Hmm. Yeah. It's one of the most painful things for me to listen to. It, when people really go into that shame, it's just yeah, ah, yeah, that's not a fun place to go. No, it's not a fun place to go, and it's not a fun place to see somebody go. And I, I can I, I just why is that hard for you? Because I, it, it will help me if you'll tell me. Because I'll, I'll tell you well, why. So I, I could sort of walk by like Joe Melnick and just go, well, that's a weird thing to think. Right. But it's not just thinking and it's just a completely internal experience of self. Right. That I can't do anything about from See, the that, outside. That's right. That's the thing. That's what's so hard I, about I can't it for logic you that, out of yes, it. I can't no. coach you. No, that's ah. right. That's yeah. It's really difficult when people feel like that because you can't reach them. And I feel <laughs> so unreachable. And I that, that that's it's 
so I think that's why it was kind of helpful mm -hmm. because it reached me in a funny way. He, he, you know, whatever Joe was doing, I don't think it was, I think it was just kind of an offhand comment, but it kind of, it kind of helped mm -hmm. because it, it, you know, in a certain way, there's such a profound feeling of badness in a certain way you have to pull yourself out of it because anybody comes into it, they somehow they, they're, they're not, they don't get it and they can't, you know, that's what you said. There's not much you can do about it, but that helped. So there yeah. you go. I, I think it comes back to what you said about the relationship and, you know, psychoanalysts rejoice. It comes back to your mom. And <laughs> just, just knowing that, you know, if I crawl out of the hole, there's somebody out there and that's I might right. be able to even have a relationship with yeah. them. That would be nice. Yeah. I think that was one of the things Sonia was so good at. She never tried to fix people. Mm -hmm. She never tried to fix people. She just always, always, always joined them. She always joined them. She never tried to fix people. It was so terrific to be joined rather than somebody trying to fix you. Mm -hmm. So that in a lot of ways has been my biggest challenge in life is, is how I can fall into these pits. Hmm. And what about a highlight? on the other side of the pit. So I have two highlights, okay? One was, I, I had a football coach in college who I adored. He was, he was like out of central casting of a football coach. You know, he had a broken nose and he you know, kind of talked like he was chewing gravel but he was smarter than hell. And um, I was an odd duck on the football team because um, I, I never much cared about hurting people. In fact, I, it just never, that just wasn't any of what I did. I loved playing football. I loved the athleticism of it. Um, and I'd have football coaches say, you know, Simon, if you just get tough, you could be pretty good. And uh, I wasn't going to be poor. I was just going to be me. But this guy really liked me. He was one of my he was one of my college coaches. He didn't really care much whether I was. He just liked that I played well. And one day at practice, he said, "Simon, you have the quickest feet in the conference." That was really important. So that was one. The second one was when Sonia invited me to be part of the faculty. These are the two highlights of my life. You know, I have kids. I love my kids. They were so important to me. If they're watching this, they have to understand. Yeah, you have the kids too. You have the kids too. Yeah. <laughs> So all of that, okay? But this is just about me. When Sonia selected me to be part of the faculty, it, it may, when, the, when the coach said, Simon, you have the quickest feet in the conference, it was so meaningful to me, but I understood it too, because he was right. Mm -hmm. He didn't, he wasn't saying, you know, you're, you gotta be tough. And I, he was seeing me clearly, right. my athleticism, my capacity to play. But he saw it, and I really liked that, and it really meant a lot to me, obviously, you can see. Mm -hmm. When Sonia picked me to be on the faculty, it made no sense to me. Mm -hmm. I was completely caught off guard. I, I, couldn't, um, I couldn't figure it out. I didn't think I knew enough. I didn't think I would be uh, impactful enough. I didn't think I'd be effective enough. And it scared me mm -hmm. because I... For a brief moment, I thought Sonia has been blinded by something. So when the coach said it to me, I felt seen. When Sonia mm -hmm. said it to me, I thought, oh, Sonia fucked up here. But it was also so delightful. So I was kind of stuck mm. because I, I really wanted to be chosen, if you will. But I, I, it really scared me. So, so I, I 
I made a deal with, I went and asked her, I said, okay, Sonia, I'm going to, I'm, I'm really struggling with this. So I'm going to ask you to tell me why you picked me. And she did. Didn't help at all. Didn't help one bit, none. Okay. So I, I said to her, um, I'm going to ask you three times over the course of a year. And I'm, you'll answer it because I know you, you'll answer it. And I'm going to see if it helps. So I asked her and about three months later, I asked her again, about four months later, I asked, it didn't help at all. So one, and so I just kind of gave up. I just said, well, I'm just going to have to, you know, I'm here, I'm teaching, I'm going to have to do this, but secretly uh, feeling like a fraud. Yes, okay. Quickest feet in the conference. Macro I can own. level imposter syndrome. Right yes, there. right. Uh -huh. Quickest feet in the conference. I'm all over it. Pick me to teach in the, uh, at the Cape Cod training program, not even a little bit. So I just decided to endure it. And one, one, um, one weekend I was uh, doing some teaching with a group and I had Sonia come in at the end just to, to say, good, you know, I, it was like a three day training. And we had this whole goodbye and the people were really quite um, laudatory. And we got into the car, Sonia was driving her home and she looked over at me and she said, now do you know why I picked you? And that was the first time that it made sense. So those two moments, quickest feet in the conference and teaching in the Cape Cod training program with, mm -hmm. with Sonia. Why did it make sense? Uh, because my experience teaching with this group had, had been gone very, very well. Mm -hmm. And she was watching them say goodbye to me. Mm. And she knew what had happened over these she made up a story that they wouldn't only say it they wouldn't say goodbye that way if something if we hadn't done some good work with each other hmm. but she hadn't forgotten that i never really understood it mm -hmm. so this was like two years later and and she told me three times three times didn't help i gave up i was going to teach anyway but i was going to feel like i didn't belong mm -hmm. But she never forgot. So it, hmm. it was right up there with quickest feet in the conference. It was just as good as that. Hmm. Those are two highlights. Well, I, I have, I think the answer is a yes, but I'm interested. Do you feel like you're part of a Gestalt community? After I do. Yes, mm -hmm. I really do. Uh, I teach at uh, Gestalt International Study Center. I um, teach with in the, the I, I teach with three different faculties. Mm -hmm. um, I teach for the Cape Cod training program. I teach um, in our coaching program. We have a, an ICF certified coaching program, and I teach a couple of programs just on on my own. Just um, but I feel really um, closely identified and in, in in community. Uh, with the Cape Cod training program, kept faculty, Carol probably told you, Carol Brockman, Joe Melnick, uh, Nancy uh, Rukowski, we now just uh, brought in a, a woman, Lucy Ball, and my life partner, Sharona Halpern. Um, mm -hmm. So the five or six of us make up that faculty. And it's just a treat to be part of that group. We all miss Sonia terribly. We, when we started out, Sonia Nevis and, and uh, Joseph Zinker uh, uh, and Penny Backman were part of the faculty. Sonia passed away, Joseph's no longer working and Penny's no longer working. But I still feel a tremendous amount of collegiality with the five or six of us and same thing with the coaching program. But more importantly, with the whole center uh, mm -hmm. I really feel part of that community. Uh, I, 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 I miss a little bit feeling a part of the broader Gestalt community. I, I you know, AAGT, which is now I understand IAGT, yeah. and and I, I, I'm not sure why we haven't made a better connection with that with the broader Gestalt community. But I feel part of the GISC community and look forward to 
perhaps feeling part of the, the bigger Gestalt community. Sounds like it might be part of the answer to my last question, which is what next? I mean, what's next for you and what do you think should or could be next for Gestalt? Yeah. Um, well, I'm 70 and a lot of people retire when they're 70, but I have no interest in retiring, not even a teeny little bit. Mm -hmm. I have more interest in in doing more things, but this has not been a year for doing more things. This has been a year for no. doing way fewer things. Um, so I have interest in, in doing more um, uh, fun things and create, you know, seeing more, doing more traveling or seeing more live music or that sort of thing. Um, but I don't have any interest in retiring. So the next thing for me is to continue what I'm doing. Mm -hmm. But um, you, I don't know if you know this, Joe is a big champion of uh, AAGT, IAGT. And, mm -hmm. and um, I, I, he, he, he keeps nudging us and saying, you know, why aren't we becoming more of the, uh, the broader Gestalt community? So maybe that is a next thing. Right now, the next thing is just continue. I just love what I'm doing so much that uh, I, I, I don't need a big next. I just need a, a, a lot of, of continuing to do what I do. And do you see a next for Gestalt? Or should it just continue to do what it's doing as well? Well, boy, that seems like, that seems like a, a, a question for a, a whole weekend workshop. Because you know what I mean, but it could be a conference theme, actually. Yeah, it could be. It probably has been, has it? I don't know. It should be. Um, well, I, you know, I, I wasn't teasing entirely when I said that I spent some of my early years not saying I was a Gestalt therapist. It, you know, the Boston area is very, very conservative in that way. I mean, it, there's there's lots of different communities, but the dominant community is is you know um, medical schools you know we have harvard medical school tufts medical school we have medical schools boston university we have all these medical schools and very traditional approaches to healing and and to psychotherapy so i did spend a lot of years um not necessarily celebrating my gestaltness that's changed over the as i mentioned earlier changed over the last 10 or 15 years um Yeah, I, I can imagine being part of a world that, that tries to promote. Look, it's not like psychoanalytic theory and traditional uh, mental health approaches are having any grand success. It's not, you know, it's not like they have a, a, a track record that that ought to be able to exclude other approaches, right? Yeah, everybody's fine. We don't need anything at all. Yeah, right. <laughs> Uh, so, so it's an, I'd never thought about it before, but maybe championing Gestalt in a, in a very traditional uh, psychoanalytic world beyond just the Harvard Couples Conference. Mm -hmm. So You can go break lots of conferences. <laughs> yeah. I think that sounds like a good idea. <laughs> they were, they were very generous. They didn't see themselves as being broken at all. They, yeah. they were very generous to us and giving us time and space and, and letting us... Um, we really did. We went in and we, we, we got the sound people to give us handheld mics mm -hmm. so we didn't have to stand up there with lavalier mics and we went out into the audience and uh, they, they didn't see themselves as being broken at all. But, uh, but we did do something different. That was my, my tease. Yeah. So maybe some of that would be good. Yeah. So maybe something like that. Yeah. Bring okay. Gestalt more to the, to the non-Gestalt world around here. Sounds like a very good plan. So, and I'm I'm wondering, is there anything else that you would like to add at this point? Any piece of yourself that you felt was missing, or any final thoughts? Well, you know, I could go looking for something, but I don't. <laughs> but I don't. But it feels very complete. I appreciated your questions. I'm, I'll be interested to see what this looks like. I enjoyed uh, being interviewed. I okay. enjoyed um, 
being asked those questions that mostly people don't ever ask you, right? Mm -hmm. So uh, I may I may be uh, appalled when I look at it and say, "Oh my God, you said that!" And you, you know, <laughs> but who knows? Right now, I'm right now. I, it feels very complete right now at this moment. Okay, so should okay. we leave it here then? Sure. Okay. Why not? Thank you. And